Senator Ayim Paus Ayim, former president of the Senate and secretary to the government of the Federation between 2011 and 2015, is leaving no stone unturned to emerge the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party in the 2023 general election. In this regard, he has reportedly reached out to ex-president Olusha Gwambasunjo, good luck Jonathan, and former generals Ibrahim Ab Babangida and Abdul Salami Abubakar. The former Senate president has also had meetings with the former Minister of Defense, General Theophilus Danjuma, Chief Arthur Eze, and Chief Emmanuel Nwanyao, who blessed and endorsed his presidential bid. He has equally met some influential northern traditional rulers, like the Emir of Lafia, who also endorsed his presidential aspiration. But as he crisscrosses the country to sell his candidacy, he has placed considerable emphasis on the emergence of a president from the southern section of the country, and particularly the southeast zone. Meanwhile, he has said very little on his agenda for Nigeria, or how he intends to turn around the socio-economic fortunes of the country. Now joining us to speak on his plans for Nigeria and his chances of clinching the ticket of the PDP is Senator Ayem Paus Ayem, former president of the Senate and former secretary to the government of the Federation. Good morning, Senator Ayem, and thank you for joining us on The Morning Show. Good morning, Ruben. <laughs> Good morning. Well, quickly, let's go straight thank to business. What are you bringing to the okay. table? What are your plans for Nigerians? What are you offering if you were uh, to become president of Nigeria? Well, that's a huge question. But um, I will start by saying that, of course, you know my history, my pedigree, so to say. So I understand the country. I understand the challenges, and I think I have uh, clarity on uh, what the solutions could be. But let me say in summary that um, it is going to be my commitment to rebuild the country. And when I talk about rebuilding the country, it could, of course it's a whole huge lot of things to talk about. We talk about, I believe that the country, I can segment it this way. We have foundational issues, we have economic issues, we have uh, issues of development. And uh, if uh, for any reason you jump one to the other, like many people will just get up and say they will recalibrate uh, the security architecture, they will do this. I think they are missing the point. For me, I believe that we have certain fundamental issues that we need to address and get the country on its feet. One, for instance, we need to have a consensus on the structure of the country or the nation. We also need to have a consensus on the ideals, the dream of the nation, or if you like, the aspirations of the nation. We also need to have a consensus on the governmental systems that, works without, that will work for us. So for me, I will take, first and foremost, my commitment, uh, the first steps I will take will be to build cons consensus on this. Because what people fail to understand is that it's not a matter of generating policy and throwing it at the people. The success of any government's policy will depend largely on how much the people were able to buy into it. And to buy into this, you need to harvest the perspectives of the various uh, segments of the society and bring it together to a point that you have a consensus. I want to say that the whole idea of consultation, which I am doing presently, is to harvest the perspectives of uh, very, uh, different uh, stakeholders in the country and uh, I weld them together. Immediately I step in as president, build consensus on what works for all of us, on what is acceptable to all of us, then wrong with it. On economic issues, I am convinced that the 21st century, particularly the second half of the 21st century we are, we are moving into, it's not like any time before. So for me, the drivers of the economy will now be on in industrialization or manufacturing, if you care, um, talent and innovation, science and technology. This could be, this certainly are going to be the key drivers of the economy of the second half of 21st century. And I will develop this, build out this, and prepare Nigeria 
to fit into the fourth industrial revolution. That will create jobs. That obviously will expand the economy. That will make the economy more competitive and more dynamic, and it will diversify the economy. I will also focus on the enablers of development, the factors, the things, the circumstances, the situations that promote prosperity and development, like security, like education, like governance issues. And when I mean governance issues, it means consistent policies, it means regulation, regulatory issues, and all that. Then the legal framework and all that. So those issues, uh, the enabling uh, 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 issues are critical to make the economic uh, uh, challenges, uh, the economic pillars work. And the fundamental issues, we generate patriotism that will drive the whole system. And I can tell you that if I become president of Nigeria, I will approach rebuilding the country from these three perspectives, segment them properly, pursue them with commitment and determination, and for sure we will deliver a result. The gaps people have and why many governments have failed or many administrations have failed is because you just wake up and throw a policy on the people and you find out that it doesn't work. And I can say that by my experience in government, I have seen how various governments approach some of these issues, the ones that worked and the ones that didn't work. And I'll make the difference. Right, this is exactly what I wanted to ask you. You've talked about so many things. That consensus building seems to be a theme here. Are we going to have another constitutional conference? That's my first question. And my second question is why you? Why should Nigerians trust you at this particularly precarious point in which we find ourselves? I mean, we know you as a senator from Emboy in state who became Senate president. You were later secretary to the federal government. But what have you done to serve Nigerian people and why should you be trusted? Well, maybe let me start from your first question, which is whether we are going to have a national conference. I think that is not the issue. We have had enough. But however, if it is the desire of the Nigerian people, no problems about that. But I think we have enough documents that need to fine tune to reach understanding. The, the problem is getting everybody agree that the way to go is, uh, is, uh, is acceptable to all. It's really not a matter of uh, organizing another conference, but it's a matter of saying, okay, this is your perspective as you have presented here. This is your perspective as we have presented here. Can we reach a middle course? So importantly, it's not a matter of what this feel or what this other one feels, but it's what we agree to do. Once we reach that consensus, we mustn't need, well, we can reach that consensus without a new conference. But if the Nigerian people desires one, that is not a problem. My commitment is to be sure that I do the will of the Nigerian people. Now, if you ask me what I bring to the table, uh, that is why Nigerians should trust me. I think if you know my history, of course, that question would not arise. You will really help me answer the question. I was president of the Senate. And I inherited a very troubled reading Senate, and I brought stability to that Senate. And I want to say that I will bring stability to this country. I was secretary to government of the Federation, and if you care, you will also know Ruben was in government with us. I was all able to help the president focus majorly governance issues that had that actually struck a balance in that administration. And that's the uniqueness that Nigerians are missing today uh, uh, on uh, the President Goodluck's administration. We worked together, we assisted the president to, to the best we can to achieve what Nigerians are missing today. And I think I was at the center of the administration of that uh, government. And uh, I want to believe that, of course, the footprints we were able to drop here and there are very clear. And I think uh, I am that one Nigerian that can find a home anywhere in the, in the country, very much across the country. I grew up largely, I started my career in Sokoto when I served in Sokoto. But importantly, I can tell you that there is no part of this country that I will go to today, and I am not at ease. And if you check my history, if you check my career service, I have never had any issue of ethnicity or whatever we ever had presided. When I was in the Senate, 
there was no issue of where you come from. I was able to put everything on the table, build uh, greater understanding across board, respected everybody, and earned the trust of everybody. If I can earn the trust of Nigerians as president of the Senate, I earned the trust of Nigerians as secretary to government, I think I will do better as president of Nigeria. So being president of Nigeria <clears throat> demands a lot of decision making. I'd like to ask you, what are the parameters that define how you, as an individual, make your decisions? That's one. Number two, I'd like to ask you, because you also work with people, what informs your decision to trust people? And what informs your decision to go with them even when they have done wrong? Well, what I can say generally is that, one, nobody is a saint, but the parameters for choosing those to work with will be competence, will be capacity, will be experience. When you put this together, these are the only human factors you can see. The other ones are the ones you may not see. And you will be diligent enough to monitor the performance of each person. When any person moves out of your vision, then of course you should be able to call the person to order or make a change. So in making a decision, I want to say that, and I am emphatic on maybe at times people will come and say they will do this, they will do that. The country has gone beyond that, and this is 21st century. It's not a matter of one-man rule. It's rather a matter of collective will of the people giving effect to it. And I think that is the, govern the governance I want to put on the table. Harvest the collective will of the people and give it a drive to, to progress and success. So in making decisions, I should be able to, to be sure not only those around me influences that decision, it must be the collective will of the Nigerian people. The process of decision making, yes, the box stops on my table, but there must be enough consultation on any critical issue. Because once the policy you put on the table is not acceptable by the people, it's bound to fail. So it is my duty to make sure that I have a buy-in of the generality of the people and all segments of the, the, the country before deploying any policy or any pol making any policy decision. So I want to believe that that is the demands of democracy. I want to believe that that is the demands of a diverse, um, of um, uh, an, um, a country that uh, has a, a diverse, a, a country that is diverse in its components or constitution. So in a diverse uh, country of like ours, if you don't carry everybody, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't enforce by good governance inclusiveness, inclusiveness, then the tendency is that you will struggle to make a success of your decisions or policies. And uh, I can tell you that in all my decision making, I'll take into consideration the diverse nature of our country. I'll take into consideration the moment, the type, the, the stage in our development, and. I will, I will take into consideration the basic principles of democracy. Well, you've been uh, going around the country consulting uh, certain leaders of Nigeria. I know I read uh, an article by uh, Dele Momodu, who is also a presidential aspirant, talking about the owners of Nigeria. Will it be correct to say that the, uh, those names I read off at the beginning uh, was an attempt on your part to consult those uh, who have been described as the owners of Nigeria. And what kind of feedback are you getting? Then Oanezi uh, Ndigbo uh, Worldwide General Assembly, uh, the National Secretary, uh, Alex Ogbonia, uh, he was quoted as saying that, well, Oanezi Ndigbo has set uh, criteria for Igbos who want to be a president, and that at some point, when everybody comes out, and they have a list, they will invite, uh, they will intervene and probably appeal to one person to step down for the other. If that were to happen, would you be willing to step down for anybody uh, from the Southeast? Already at the moment, we have three of you, uh, you know, who are very prominent. Well, 
maybe I would not use the word of uh, the Lema model to say that there are owners of Nigeria. But my experience uh, as a result of my arising from my consultation had been that some people who led this country before share deep concerns about the future of the country and they want the best for the country. And it was necessary that I share views with them, harvest their perspective, and uh, see how I deploy that uh, uh, to help myself forge ahead. So I am not sure I can call them the owners of the country, but I can call them former leaders of the country that actually share some concern about the country. In fact, deep concerns about the future of the country. So and, um, and, uh, my consultation so far, I can say, has been quite inspiring and uh, encouraging. And what I discovered is that everybody wants the best for this country. Everybody desires the progress of the country. Everybody wants the unity of the country. Everybody wants the prosperity of the country. And I think that is what all of us want, no matter where you come from. Yes, there are a few issues of, I come from here, I want in this world, but the central issue is that we want the progress of the country because everybody feels the pain when the country is not uh, progressing and we have no other country. So everybody wants a country he can be proud of. And I think that is what is common amongst everybody. And uh, I want to say that that's, that's, that's uh, my experience from the consultation. Now, on um, what you said, Johannes, oh, what you said, Johannes, the secretary said. Yes. Uh, yeah, well, whatever you call it, Johannes and <laughs> Okay. You know, it, yes. It, well, I, I want to say, I want to say that that is not to my knowledge. One, there is, I didn't have such communication. But I want to say that, yes, we may come from Southeast, but we are looking to rule Nigeria. So whoever must be the president of Nigeria must not be whoever that the Southeast had handpicked. And I think, I don't know, I am not sure, like I said, it's not to my knowledge. I am concerned about, one, making myself acceptable to Southeast, making myself acceptable to Northeast, making myself acceptable to Southwest, making myself acceptable to Northwest, and making myself acceptable to North Central because I am seeking to be the president of Nigeria. And one thing I can say straight away is that virtually uh, at the primary level, every person will emerge from his own party. And I do not see how any ethnic group will come to decide for a party, a national party, who to be their candidate or who they would, uh, how they would ask somebody they have uh, uh, preferred to be their candidate to step down. I don't know how that will work, and I don't want to get into that. But I want to say that my, my commitment is to preside over Nigeria, and I must be acceptable and accepted by every part of the country, and that's what I seek. Well, that's a really pan-Nigerian way of looking at the problem. But those who are arguing, and there are many who are arguing in favor of a president of Igbo extraction this time, are talking about equity and justice, and that it has happened before with the Southwest, when in 1999, when you emerged as Senator from Ebonyi, the two presidential candidates of the main parties were from the Southwest. What is your take on that with regards to the Southeast, or generally even a president of Igbo extraction, and the fact that a lot of Igbos feel marginalized in the current Nigerian political process? Well, I would say that, uh, one, the issue of uh, equity, fairness, justice is certainly a fundamental issue. Two, when in 99, the two presidential candidates emerged from Southwest. Eventually, President Obasanjo became the president. He was president of Nigeria. He wasn't president of Southwest. And it was much of his votes were from outside Southwest. In fact, Southwest didn't vote for him. And that is the reason why it is very important and very, very, very critical that every person aspiring should realize that, look, you have to be a candidate for the country and of the country, and not just of any particular ethnic group. So, but the issue of equity, fairness, and justice is a fundamental issue, fundamental in the sense that 
Our constitution is clear on this. The fundamental principle of, the, of state policy is captured in chapter two of the constitution. And chapter uh, vast, uh, sec section 13 of that uh, section mandated every government and every government agency or department to commit to applying the principles listed under chapter two. And uh, I think subsection three of uh, that, uh, of section 13, talked about federal character. And again, use the words you, are used, you have just used. Use the factor of equity, use the factor of unity, and all that. And he said, for this reason, every aspect of the national governance must reflect federal character. I think that is what we are saying. What we are saying is that, fine, the presidency had been to the north. It is the turn of the south. And that makes sense. Now, in PDP, which is my party, it is also in the PDP constitution, clean, clear. In fact, section seven, I think section seven, three C, was clear on rotation and zoning. That section says, in fact, it's a fundamental principle of uh, PDP. It says that there should be rotation of the elective offices of the nation between not and south. I have had people argue that there are other zones in the country that have not president, pre, uh, produced president, like northeast and north central and other. It's, it's not the argument. This is not the issue. The zoning principle in the PDP constitution is clear. It said it's not south. So when it gets to the south, they can microzone within their own zone region. When it gets to north, the same. Just like what we did when we zoned the political, the party offices of the PDP. When we zone the party offices of the PDP, what we did was to zone north-south. Then north will now go back and microzone within their zones, and south now went back and microzone within their zones. It is clear. So, and the reason is, every se section of the country must have, you know, a sense of belonging, a sense of inclusiveness, a sense of entitlement as a citizen of the country to aspire to a new office in the country. And it's only fair. The rules have been established. The principle is understood. So not following it, of course, will be, will be a burden on the conscience of the nation. All right. That's my take. OK, so you were former Senate president. And the complaint year in, year out is that the budget is being padded and the National Assembly is fingered. In fact, this year it is said that this budget has got over 400 duplicated projects to the tune of over 300 billion. And there's a back and forth always between the executive and the legislative. What are the ideas you have as regards stopping budget padding? Two, I'd like to know, what is your greatest fear about Nigeria? Well, maybe I start from the last question. I really, I really do not have much fears about Nigeria because I believe that the challenges we have today, one, one or the other, they are temporary. Then two, if you ask me, what really are those challenges? Is simply leadership challenges. And once you have the right leadership, things will reverse. So I really do not have a fear. If you ask me, if you insist that I must tell you the fears I have, it's just the commitment of Nigerians to, to, to realize that we have no other country. And because we are diverse in our composition, we must be fair, we must be equitable, we must be just. Once we do that, we apply that across board in the management of the national affairs, of course, we'll be able to progress as a nation. So I don't really have any fears because there is no challenge before us that cannot be surmounted. It's just getting the right leadership. Now, about the National Assembly. You remember at the beginning of 99, I was in the National Assembly to the point that I headed the National Assembly as president of the Senate and chairman of the National Assembly. I can always say that uh, whatever you see in the National Assembly is a function of the character in the villa. And so I don't discuss the National Assembly outside my own National Assembly because the challenges may be different. What they are facing, I may not have faced during my time. But during my time, I can talk about my time. I know that during my time, we had no, no budget issues as, as such. And uh, 
the way budgets are implemented are not the same. And it varies. When uh, President Obasanjo was uh, in the National Assembly, National Assembly had a peculiar challenges of its own. When President Goodluck uh, was the uh, president of the uh, country, the National Assembly had the best of times, so anybody can testify. When uh, President uh, Goodluck, it goes, the summary of my position is that whatever you see happening in the National Assembly is a function of the character in the villa. And so there is no, I don't have any basis to talk about National Assembly and I don't usually like talking about National Assembly. I'd like to interrogate you more of that. You say whatever happens, whatever padding that is going on is a function of the character and the villa. So are you saying the villa is aiding the padding of the budget? Are you saying the villa is aiding corruption? Because ICPC no, investigated National Assembly recently. Pardon. Yeah. No, 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 no. I don't know what you mean by pardon. I said I don't want to go into that because I don't understand. I don't know what you mean by pardon. But what I'm saying is that budget is originated from outside the National Assembly. It's sent to National Assembly. Budget sessions are arranged between National Assembly and the various departments of government. They reach an agreement pass the budget and send back to the president. On satisfaction that uh, the budget could go, the presidents are sent to it. So I am, whatever, you, you may have your best word for whatever you are complaining about. But I said, I don't want to discuss National Assembly. Okay, uh, Senator, I am quickly, two things. Uh, the first question is hypothetical. The second one is specific. The hypothetical question has to do with Namdi Kanu, the leader of IPOP who is uh, undergoing trial. And, you know, you know very well uh, that the uh, wheel of justice in Nigeria grinds slowly. And the election, the presidential election, is just about a year away. If we were to win and emerge as the next president of Nigeria, and that Namdi Kanu matter is still dragging before the court, uh, what will be your response? What will you do? Will you just uh, pardon him and ask him to go, or you will insist uh, that the course of justice should continue, uh, you know, whichever way it goes. And then second part of the question, which I say is more specific, what are those things that you will retain from this current administration, the Buhari administration? And what are those things that you are likely to do differently? Well, on Namde Kano, I, will, I always avoided the situation whereby a national problem is treated as a regional problem. The insecurity in the Southeast or the role of Namde Kano should be treated as a national problem. Just like uh, Sunday Boho in the Southwest should be treated as a national problem. Such that uh, Mohammed Yusuf of blessed memory, of course, should be treated as a national problem. And why I must say this is that no part of the country today is spared of, uh, of insecurity or some form of challenges or the other. And in containing them, it's national, national resources that is deployed to contain them. If you ask me what I will do, I will put together all the challenges we have on insecurity and, and devise a, a strategy of containing them. But like I did say, that part of, that uh, one of the cardinal enablers of development is security. Security of lives and property is very primary to the purpose of government. So the containing the insecurity in the land should be my primary concern. But I won't treat them segment by segment, uh, canon by canon, with son di boho by son di boho, uh, boko haram by boko haram. We will develop an architecture that will secure people, that will secure Nigerians and secure the property of Nigerians and guarantee progress to Nigeria. So I, I, I would, for any reason, not think about what I would do about Namde Kano. I would think about how to secure Nigeria. And wherever anybody fits in, or any actor in the theater fits in, it will be treated uh, accordingly and along that general principle. Then if you ask me, what will I change or what will I do differently from what uh, the present government is doing? Again, I may not be upfront in saying this one or this other one, but I want to say something. What has set us back is a situation where 
when a government comes into power, he will now take a sweep on the other government and flush everything good or bad out. It has set us back greatly. And I'll give two instances that will justify my approach. When President Yadua took over from President Obasanjo, President Yadua continued Obasanjo's policy on the Niger Delta uh, uh, insurgency or the Niger Delta armed uh, uh, insurgency, so to say. And President Yadua drove it to a conclusion. And today we have peace in the Niger Delta. Even every other attempt to recreate that challenge in the Niger Delta never worked because it was addressed properly. It was managed very well from government to government. Another example I'll give you is that of uh, President Goodluck on Boko Haram and President Buhari on Boko Haram. When President Buhari came on board, the first he did was to sweep away all that the architecture that uh, President Goodluck put in place on Boko Haram. And what did we get? The matter escalated beyond control. I want to believe that maybe if we had continued with, from uh, where good luck stopped, maybe the result may have been different. So I am not going to take a sweep. I will look at what is on ground, what is proper and progressive, what addresses the solution, and understand it properly, advance it, where necessary, or review it where unnecessary, but not because it was started by this government, or it was not my administration, or that this government has seven point agenda, and I have 10 points agenda. No, government should be a continuum, and the country should be forced. So I am not, I, I, I may not be upfront to say I'll pick and choose this. I will look at them within the perspective of national interest. Right, we're running out of time, but I need your take on two very important issues. It appears now that there's finally movement on the Orosanye report, and the federal government has said that they will not be sacking workers as they try to rationalize federal government agencies and parastatals. What is your take on that and how that should be done? What agencies should be scrapped? Well, which one should be maintained? You would know about that. We need your take on that. And also the intractable war against corruption in this country. What does it take to actually get a hold of the issue of corruption? In terms of progress, obviously some has been made, but we're a long way to go. What is your plan about those two issues? Well, on our Osaya report, when we did our Osaya report, we left no stone unturned. We set up the committee to review, of course I was involved with it, it was under my supervision, to review all that, what should stay, what should be merged, and we did a white paper on them. So, of course, when the committee concluded, when Rasanya concluded, we took the report to council and approved the white paper. Now, the, of course we were not able to implement it before the administration of President Goodluck came to an end. Then, the, when the government of uh, President Buhari came on, well, they didn't see a reason why they should continue with it. And uh, much later now, they are giving a consideration to it. <laughs> I can only say that I stand by the white paper of uh, Oransanya report because I was part of it. So, but however, things are continually changing. If I become president today, I'll bring it up for review. Where it is still necessary to keep, we will keep. Where it is necessary not to, we will. But the critical thing will be to be sure that national interests prevail. The growth of society and the governance issues have become quite more dynamic. And the way things are going, I am not saying that everything we did in the white paper must stand or not stand. But I stand by that white paper because I was part of it. But if things have changed and we need to review any, why not? Two, on uh, issues of uh, corruption. Honestly, of course, you know, at times when we talk about this issue of corruption, one, the first bill we did when we came to National Assembly was ICPC bill. That was the first bill of Bassan just submitted to us, which it was such uh, an, a, a very contentious issue there because the then president was like in a hurry that the bill must be passed urgently. And eventually, under the leadership of uh, the then president of the Senate, Chuba Okadibo, we passed that bill. The last bill, 
I did uh, in the National Assembly before I left was the ICPC bill. And the ICPC bill also came as a matter of urgency because at that time, the financial tax force, International Financial Tax Force based in Paris blacklisted Nigeria as a non-cooperating com uh, country on uh, money laundering. And what was required was for there to be a particular institution in Nigeria that regulates and monitors uh, money laundering. Now, the danger if we don't pass that, if we did not pass the bill as urgently as it required, was that the, the, banking, the banking industry in Nigeria will run into a hitch, and the country will, of course, run into a series of problems. So, as a matter of commitment, we bent backwards to process that bill, pass that bill. In fact, I can tell you that we had to stay extra hours on our last day in, a, in the Senate to confirm Nuhu Ribadu as the chairman of ICPC, of um, EFCC, so that that act would be in place and the agency would take off, and it did take off. One way or the other, the two agencies have come to be, and they have responsibility for, corruption, for monitoring corruption, punishing corruption, and the bills, the laws also have gone through, the acts also have gone through some amendments, and out of which may, may have expanded it from the original, original uh, scope for which we passed it. If I am president of the uh, country, corruption is still a central nagging issue in our developmental process, uh, progress. I will look at the act, look at the performance so far, and if there are places that uh, should, be, should require adjustment, we adjust it. If they do not require adjustment, but the operations need fine tuning, we fine tune it to achieve the purpose for which uh, the two agencies were set up. I also know that uh, in our Sanya report that, uh, that we talked about later, that there were proposals that the two agencies should be merged. Again, that is also not somebody, what somebody will sit down in one place and say this, because I, over time, you, you, you can see that the operations of the two agencies are different. The ICPC operates in a very different way from the way uh, EFCC operates. But my encouragement to Nigerians is that, look, these agencies should do their work. And I have always said that as long as the agency is in place, they should, do, they should be allowed to do their work. Mm -hmm. And people would always say, ah, they have invited you. I said, yes, if they invite me, I will go. I was at the center of administration in President Goodluck's uh, government, and everybody in Goodluck's government has been invited by EFCC. So why not me? If they invite me, I will go. But, and uh, I am, I can say today, I have no charges okay. on any issue whatsoever from EFCC or ISPC, SCPC. Okay. But if they require my explanation anytime, I walk up to them and they make explanation. Okay. There's a popular saying that the economy is not stupid. Hypothetically, if you get in the chance to lead Nigeria, and I like the word lead better than rule Nigeria, uh, you will be inheriting a debt stock of over 40 trillion, 15% unemployment rate, I mean, 15% uh, inflation rate, close to 40% unemployment rate, 33.3 now, but if more numbers come in, it might be bigger than that, and a lot more other economic challenges. So what would you do about debt, for instance? What would you do about probably inflation and unemployment? Maybe, maybe I will help you present it in a more frightening manner. I understand that last year, the nation, the, the nation earned about 5.5 trillion as a revenue. And out of this 5.5 trillion, 4.2 trillion went into debt servicing and debt repayment, leaving about 1.3 trillion to run the country. As a result of which, when the government realized that they can't run the country with 1.3 trillion, they had to go for borrowing and the debt stock continue to pile. I also want to believe that, um, as a matter of uh, rule, unwritten though, that uh, you are not allowed to borrow more than 40% of your GDP. 
and our borrowing rate now is at and our borrowing rate now is about 36.9 percent i think that will make it more frightening for anybody coming in but i can tell you that even that that does not scare me i have said at the beginning that the challenges are temporary and the challenges are that of leadership it's just to adjust the leadership but if I am to focus the economy like I did say before, I will focus the economy on the contemporary world economic direction. Manufacturing, talent and innovation, science and technology. The whole idea here is that job will multiply on their own as different from what we are doing presently. If you elevate talent and, uh, and uh, innovation, then all you need to do is simply to so create the infrastructure for, for innovation, then support uh, uh, support new startup businesses, new startup, uh, startup businesses, then uh, just Concentrate on what will create jobs on its own. Uh, support support the younger ones in setting up their own businesses in such a manner that they don't need to wait for government employment. And once they create their own businesses, they will be in a position to employ others. The advantage of private sector employment is that it is more efficient, it is more rewarding in terms of payment of salaries, and uh, it is more productive. But when employment is left only for government agencies and all that, it becomes less productive, it becomes less efficient, it becomes an entitlement, and it does not uh, work. So I will focus on those things that will create an economic environment that will encourage talented Nigerians to deploy their talents and eventually focus on innovation that we fit into the fourth industrial revolution that is already here with us. And once we fit into the, the fourth industrial revolution, people are no longer sitting back to apply for job, apply for this, apply for that. They will create jobs themselves. They will support themselves. They will, the, whole, the whole scenario will change. And I want to believe that uh, that will help Get us, us, get us out of uh, the issue of borrowing to pay salaries, borrowing for the current expenditure, and, and all that. So I want to believe that my economic direction will actually shift from where we are today to a new dimension that is the new direction of the world economy. And the world economy now focuses on younger talents and innovation. And I want to believe that uh, certainly that will make the difference. Well, uh, Senator, I am just one more question, uh, if we can do that in less than uh, two minutes. Uh, when I was reading the introduction, I said you've consulted with uh, former leaders, including uh, former President Goodluck Jonathan, and you work for his administration. But there's this rumor out there uh, that President Jonathan uh, may run again uh, in uh, 2023. If that were to happen, another hypothesis, uh, will you feel obliged uh, to uh, allow him and uh, you step down within the party, considering the relationship that both of you uh, have? And did that issue come well, up? Well, I haven't had... I, I haven't had, and he hasn't told me, but... Wait now, <laughs> and we are in touch on very regular basis. And before I started this journey, of course, he was the first person I consulted. So there is nothing I am doing that he doesn't know. So he hasn't told me he's going to run or he's about to run. But if he tells me, we'll go and discuss it. He's my boss, and he will never be my boss. I think that is my position. Well, thank you very much, Senator. I am boss. Boss. I will always be my boss. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. Thank you very much for joining us on The Morning Show. Thank you very much. Indeed.